Hello, good evening, everyone. I hope you guys can hear me well. If you can, uh, please do drop a comment in uh, in the question section. Uh, I'd also like to welcome you all to this webinar and uh, thank you for taking the time to attend. My name is Calvin and I'm going to be your host through this webinar. Today, we're going to talk about the importance of a fintech course in the technology driven banking landscape. And we're also going to discuss why the majority of bankers felt the need to opt for a course in fintech. Hopefully, by the end of this webinar, we're going to leave you with interesting insights into the value of fintech and its many applications. Our esteemed speaker today is Mr. Vinay Solanki. Vinay has over 13 years of experience encompassing roles in strategy, partner management, business development, mobile money fraud, and building trade platforms for fixed income products. He is Director of Strategy and Market Development at Eris Communications, a leading IoT platform and solutions player headquartered in the Silicon Valley. He has also led IoT and Wi-Fi strategy and business development at Bharti Airtel and has worked as VP of Technology at Goldman Sachs in New York. Let me hand it over to Vinay so that he can take over from here. Vinay, go ahead. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, can you hear me properly? Am, am I audible? Hello? Yes, yes, Vinay, we can hear you. Okay, okay. excellent, excellent. And yeah, I am assuming that you guys are able to see uh, the screen. I'm sharing the presentation. Uh, the first slide is there up on the page. Okay? I, yes. Okay, I'm just moving to the agenda slide uh, to make sure that you guys are able to see my screen. Okay, great. So uh, thanks to Calvin uh, for the introduction um, for myself. And uh, as Calvin has mentioned, uh, today what we will do is we will spend our next 40 to 45 minutes um, covering the role of financial technologies, how it is disrupting the finance industry, both uh, the financial banking industry and the related tangential financial services industries. Um, how, like what kind of role uh, uh, as a banker uh, can we, uh, played by you if you are actually working in a, a traditional banking services industry um, to retain your professional growth what kind of uh, technologies or what kind of skills you can acquire or should acquire to remain competitive uh, with the changing interest uh, the environment and the infrastructure around around you uh, and then we will also talk uh, and briefly touch upon the new age fintech technologies including payments uh, blockchain robotic process automation and, and look at the uh, markets and the ecosystem of fintech uh, globally. So moving ahead, basically, um, um, I'm assuming that all the attendees here uh, have worked in a banking industry. And uh, uh, I'm pretty sure you must have seen this movie, The Wolf of Wall Street. If you haven't, I will uh, strongly advise to go back and look at, uh, watch this movie. This movie depicts the scenario of uh, uh, what happened uh, when uh, the Wall Street started picking up uh, the um, the environment of trading stocks and and how actually the bankers became very greedy. Uh, now they represent the perfect traditional investment banking side of the world and not the retail banking. Uh, but the challenges uh, that actually will arise, uh, whether it is an investment banking scenario or a retail banking scenario are pretty common in nature. Uh, if you look at uh, the traditional banking routes, right, or or the way that the traditional banking operates, whether in India or globally, there are six major categories of uh, challenges that the traditional banking system is facing right now. Uh, the most important one is transparency. Uh, typically, if you go to any bank, uh, not today, uh, but uh, let's consider like a few years back, a couple of years back uh, in India, uh, you go for a lo loan process, you apply for the loan, uh, the banker comes, ask you to fill multiple forms, uh, collect some information from you, and then comes back and say, hey, you're approved or hey, you're not approved. Uh, most of the time when you're not approved or even if you're approved, actually you don't get much of the knowledge of what happened behind the scene. How did really the bank evaluated you as a customer or as an individual? What parameters did they consider? Did they consider how much you're earning? Did they consider what assets you have in the bank and as fixed assets and as well as, as liquid assets? 
uh, or did they also look into some other things like did you pay your EMI on time and etc. Of course, we all know that these parameters are considered, but we don't know what exactly uh, how are they evaluated and what contribution uh, goes into it. So that that is one of the biggest uh, challenge that was faced by the banking industry uh, before uh, fintech came into picture uh, channels. So second and the more important one is like how do I reach my customers like how do I provide customer service? What are the customer interfaces? Uh, how do they connect and use my system? Do they have to go to the branch? Do they go to the ATM? Do they go just on a mobile phone uh, and so on? And are they all in sync? Uh, are they all actually giving a single behavior to my customer? Uh, especially in the retail banking side. In Western banking, uh, of course, uh, your touch points will be more of a person who is handing you as a, as, a, as a customer. But when you go to retail banking and you do all these multiple types of transactions from bill payment to withdrawal of money, you have different interfaces. The channels are not really tied together well. They're fragmented in nature. Then comes the the services and 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 other things that is provided by the bank. Um, if you see clearly like what happens um, uh, the way that the bank charges you the transaction fee, uh, the way that bank actually pays you the money or the interest rate that you get on the money that you save in the bank account. Uh, it's not not very attractive, right? It's very expensive. Uh, the reason it is expensive is because the traditional banking used to run in a brick and mortar way. Uh, um, and and they, their fixed cost was very high and if your cost is high you will definitely pass your cost on to the customer then comes transactions the speed of transactions like how fast actually the transaction takes place um, we all know like before the advent of uh, things like UPI or uh, or wallets or, or other things where you can quickly and instantaneously transfer money or even RTGS and IMPS um, the amount of time it used to take for transferring money from one account to another uh, used to run in a couple of days. Uh, I used to go to the branch, deposit a check, uh, and then uh, the check gets uh, goes into the clearing house, and then the clearing house clears the check, and then the money is directed from my account. It goes to another account. It used to take at least uh, more than 24 to 48 hours minimum. Uh, the settlements were also delayed. Uh, the other pure reason was people were not using technology as efficiently as uh, as as today in fintech kyc uh, some of the process that you guys have come across uh, today uh, whether you do aadhar verification or you go and put in your pan card number into a system and you get verified online in matter of minutes previously it used to be a long drawn process of submitting multiple documents to the to the bank right uh, my address proof my id proof and etc and, and of course, one very, very important thing, uh, uh, especially going back to the investment banking side, uh, what happened? I don't know how many of you followed the, the debacle that happened in the financial industry when Lehman Brothers, uh, Beer Stearns crashed in the, and they, along with them, they actually took the whole market down because they became too big to fail as a company. Um, and they were so huge as, as a company who was controlling the larger ecosystem around them. And even today, if you look at SBI in India or ICIC or SDFC, they are actually a company which can be classified as too big to fail. What will happen if HDFC suddenly fails as an ecosystem? It will really crash the complete finance market in India because it actually handles such a huge volume of money um, and transactions uh, on a daily basis, right? So the bigger they become, uh, the riskier also they become to manage. Uh, at the same time, the amount of frauds that can happen in banking industries are also increasing. We recently read the news about Chanda Kuchar resigning from ICICI. Um, of course, uh, the, the reasons are differing, uh, but what we have seen in the past few months, if you are reading news, that there are too many banks and too many leaders of the banks which are coming into limelight for various reasons, whether positive or negative reasons, we don't know. This is all media. It may be true or not, but they are too uh, big to fail. Okay. So these are the six major uh, categories of uh, the challenges. Uh, but how does technology come in and help these challenges, right? So we, we covered a few areas like uh, 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 transactions uh, speed, right? Which has been changed drastically after things like RTGs, IMPs came into existence. In a matter of minutes, you actually can transfer the money or seconds. Um, we spoke about Aadhaar and other things. We spoke about uh, uh, different channels where nowadays people are actually giving you the bank, especially if you look at the new age banks like Indescent, 
yes bank right they are promoting open your account on website or on a mobile phone with few steps and actually you don't have to even go to a branch maybe they will send someone to to your home to do the kyc and everything will be done and set and your account will be active um and and uh, and more importantly there are other other things which are coming in the markets uh, for the sake of increasing the transparency uh, where fintech companies are actually telling you what exactly is going on when uh, they are evaluating you as a customer for loan or for anything else so the technology is actually disrupting every all of this six they are actually helping you solve these six challenges but at the same time uh, disrupting the industry very actively so let's look at the role of technology if you look at this uh, slide which is from cb insight perfectly represents different areas uh, where technology is coming into play in in the financial technologies this is as of uh, quarter 1 2018 from the left hand side if you look lending uh, blockchain or cryptocurrencies which is virtual currency uh, we are going to talk about in some time reg tech which is regulatory technologies which are also impacting financial industries we all know that finance industry is one of the most heavily regulated whether in india or globally and uh, there is a important role played by technology to enable the customers and also the companies uh, to manage the regulatory risk to also run the auditing and risk management and regulatory processes then comes personal finance uh, we'll talk about some of the examples of personal finance in the future slides uh, some of the startups who are actually providing you personal finance or loans actually in matter of minutes online uh, called as p2p uh, then payments and billings we all are very familiar with paytm as a, as a wallet in india uh, or other wallet systems or even other uh, applications by your bank uh, whether it is an hdfc mobile app or it is the bhim app by government or someone else they allow you to transact online integrate your the billing systems of your service provider and make the bill payment online insurance as an industry uh it is not directly related to banking but insurance is a very uh, tangentially related business because it comes under the bfsi banking financial services and insurance it is getting disrupted very actively uh, with in technology into play uh technologies like artificial intelligence machine learning uh internet of things they all are impacting uh and uh, in fact not impacting uh, positively they are impacting uh, both positively and also to a certain extent uh, disruptively Uh, where the face of insurance industry is changing especially globally i'll talk about some of the examples capital markets of course uh, are becoming uh, very tech heavy these days you can just open the account online start trading actively whether in the you know, the traditional capital market or the new age uh, uh, market in financial institutions wealth management transferring money from one point to another point it has really uh, um, been disrupted very actively and heavily uh in fact i can transfer money anywhere in the world in matter of minutes uh to anyone in different currencies um online and uh, and the last is mortgage and real estate so these are some of the areas which are being touched by technology um now if you look at this slide the majority of uses of ai in banking and payments now why ai it's very important when you look at technology uh in a standalone way right let's look at your mobile phone and in your mobile phone let's say you download a, a mobile app for uh, banking with hdfc uh, so when it goes and downloads a mobile app of hdfc bank does the authentication etc and now i can do various uh, transactions i can look at my account i can do fund transfer um, i can do bill payments uh, i can actually uh, uh, settle my uh, uh, checks and etc and other things online or or do few other things right now these are the transactions which are enabling vinay as a as a customer to transfer or make transactions but what happens behind the scene that the bank is also trying to record the behavior of how i am using this uh, services whether it is an hdfc bank uh, app or it is a paytm wallet app or it could be another uh, company's uh, digital application it is also trying to capture the data of uh, of of me as a customer and then it is able to analyze the data over a period of time and and then provide or recommend new services to me that's where the role of uh, something like machine learning comes into play where the machine actually takes data um, uh, of of me as a customer and not just my data of interacting with the bank but also my data on social media also my data on um, on my interactions happening beyond uh, the banking ecosystem uh, because they have access to my data uh, through various sources uh, which is at times scary but at times it is very handy for them 
to combine this data and to massage it uh, by, a, by a technology solution like a machine learning model and then create some new services and recommend to me. So basically personalize and customize the services to me. But if you look at this chart where the x-axis is the support uh, system of the bank, whether it is front end, back end or payments. And y-axis is the realization of uh, the technology using AI in bankings and payments. So if you look at the bubble on the right hand side, uh, the reduction in payments and frauds and reduction of false positives. Uh, there they have adopted AI very well. It has been uh, adopted and matured and realized very, uh, very well. Uh, but if you look at the, the leftmost uh, area, which is improving interactions across channels or auto saving and recommendations, uh, which is the banking front, uh, the front end uh, uh, services, they are still actually picking up. They are trying to learn your behavior so that they can recommend you new behaviors or new services. And, uh, and in the between, you see multiple services like using AI for anti money laundering. So, for example, understanding the pattern of money transfer from one um, account to another. Another account and tracking it end to end and to see if there is some kind of a sign of money laundering going on right or even for example preempting the problems uh, in in payments or securing my digital identity online so ai as a technology is impacting all of this area uh, of course with different levels of maturity and the size of the bubble actually represents the roi uh, due to the adoption of ai in those areas the bigger the size of the bubble uh, is, is bigger the potential of the roi in the particular area the source is uh, business intelligence. You can take a look at it later to read in detail what goes on here. But uh, if you look at this slide, this is very, very text heavy slide. So don't worry about it. Uh, you can read it offline once you have the slides with you. However, the key point here to look at is uh, if you look at this particular yellow circle, right, where you have different areas of banking for uh, digital for unbanked population, uh, the digital model reinventors, which is in the insurance segment. Uh, the retail value chain and the coupon systems, which is on the most on the payment size in the retail banking side, or at the bottom, if you see the small and the mid size enterprises, uh, if you look at this and take an example, right? When you look at payments, you see uh, there are mobile payments, international remittance, the mobile POS devices, and other things are coming to play. When you look at virtual marketplaces from small and mid size enterprises, you actually look at peer-to-peer -peer corporate lending and investments. We are going to talk about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, very soon. You talk about digital cash management systems or digital lockers. Um, when you look at at the top left in the retail segment, you see uh, services like peer-to-peer -peer lending for individuals, uh, aggregate aggregation and comparison of multiple services, uh, even robo advisory. Like uh, when when I'm actually running. Uh, a model using AI, I actually can build a chatbot and that chatbot actually can start interacting with you as a as an interface for the customer. And not just that, it's not only interaction, but the robot can actually also start becoming an advisor for you, for you to allow you to do your wealth management. So why to go to a human being in a big investment bank that is going to charge you an handsome fee? There might be a startup that has created some very niche solution for wealth management. And on the right hand side, of course, you see all the new age uh, terms which we are going to touch like blockchain uh, application programming interface ecosystems the big data uh, based risk assessment which is more uh, to do with the big data technology uh, anti money in laundering systems and, and know your customers like kyc processes and cyber security so yeah uh, i think it's there is no area in the banking ecosystem or insurance or financial services which is not going to be impacted by technology uh, everything is going to be disrupted whether you uh, like it or not or whether you agree or not over a period of some time it is and it is not just banking and finance uh, technologies like blockchain iot ai machine learning they are disrupting almost every industry i can think of whether it is manufacturing whether it is retail uh, whether it is transportation logistics and etc so i think it is very important and high time that you as an individual understand what is going to happen around you and maybe also become and pick up one of the skill set and be ready for the disruption or be ready for uh, 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 to be competitive in the market. Okay, now let's quickly move um, and look at some of the examples. Um, uh, in the banking area, if you look at this slide, uh, the collaboration, as I said, between the larger banks or the traditional banks, like on this slide, if you look at the left hand side, RBL Bank, it has tied up with a, a company called as MoneyTab uh, for 
uh, lending purposes. It is using a fintech technology, financial technology, where MoneyTab is actually offering this service to the RBL bank customers for lending purposes, where it is using their technology to evaluate the customer better. Or if you look at Kotak Mahindra, they're using consumer credit analytics solution by Credit Seva. So that is very simple, right? How do I evaluate the credit history of Vinay and understand whether he's a risky customer or not? And how should I decide how much loan I can offer him or approve him based on his requirement and based on his past history and maybe other records like what does he do on Facebook or on LinkedIn or Twitter or what kind of transactions he has done in the past, what kind of property he possesses, and etc. If you look at on the right hand side, a very good example by ICIC Bank when they partnered with Nikki.ai. Uh, this is an artificial intelligence based chatbot. I mentioned about chatbot, right? Uh, which is really picking up very actively in any industry where there is a customer interface required, where I don't want to spend time on my regular queries and my chatbot actually can handle that queries. Uh, the human being only comes into play when the query cannot be handled by the chatbot. Uh, but most of the time, we all know when you call a customer service, Many of time your queries are pretty standard in nature. Hey, where is my order? Hey, what happened to my transaction? Hey, uh, what is the status of my bank account? Hey, I closed my bank account. Did it got closed or not, etc. cetera. Uh, and chatbot can do a very good job here, right? Um, and and so, so far, uh, even SBI, uh, one of the largest bank in India, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the public sector bank, uh, they have adopted blockchain uh, as a technology. And in fact, I think they're evaluating blockchain for the purpose of uh, um, in the banking industry, how they can use a private blockchain for SBI. I don't know where they have reached. Uh, it's not uh, too uh, public right now. But uh, if you look at here, SDFC, Hoya, ICIC, or it is Yes Bank or any other bank, they all are have realized that if I don't adopt technology, I'm going to lose the race. It's like Nokia deciding to not adopt some technologies and, and losing the game of smartphone industry. Or it's like Kodak, uh, losing the game of understanding whether uh, the, uh, one day actually the mobile phone be camera will become so powerful that I won't even uh, need to buy a camera, uh, a tr the traditional camera or the HDRs, except if I'm an, uh, a photo uh, photographer or a professional photographer. Uh, anytime you don't ignore, if you start ignoring technology, it is going to come and disrupt you very actively. Um, we all have you know, heard about Uber. We all probably have used Uber or Ola. Um, uh, if you look at Uber in the US, actually what happened is they realized that the 30% of the new drivers that they were onboarding in US uh, did not have a bank account, uh, right? Very surprising, correct? Uh, I can I can accept if, the, if it is in India or China or maybe in a developing country, but can I realize that even in a country like USA, uh, many of the drivers did not even had a regular basic checking account. So Uber realized that what they did is they started opening a bank account for each of their driver as part of the driver onboarding process. So when you come and become an Uber driver, uh, by the way, the difference between India and US is that in, in India, only a professional number uh, like the commercial driver can apply for the Uber uh, process. In US, even if you are a, uh, if you own a car and you are a individual like me, you can actually become an Uber uh, uh, driver and you can drive Uber. So there they started realizing that many of the people both the commercial drivers and the non-commercial uh, did not have a bank account. So what they did is that before you become an Uber driver, you need a minimum checking account. And they started partnering with the bank to uh, issue a checking account and also a, a small card, like a debit card, which can be used by the driver and accept the payments when they actually drive the customer. So, so, so uh, what I'm trying to say here, uh, that the banking industry is not just running in a traditional banking mode even the tangential services like a car sharing service a uh, company like uber have realized the importance or i have realized that this is the basic uh, necessity for me uh, for my drivers and have started actually coming into this sector very actively for example if you have heard amazon recently bought an insurance company uh, because they want to enter into insurance segment and healthcare segment uh, they, they bought companies in healthcare insurance uh, right uh, uh, very soon, they also have an Amazon Pay wallet system. Likewise, Apple has something, Google has something, and so on. So it is not those that traditional banking companies which are coming into fintech. It is also the non-traditional uh, or the people who actually whose primary core business was not banking or finance are actually entering into this area. 
Uh, we talked about the peer-to-peer -peer lending. This is a snapshot from a newspaper clipping of a company called Fairset on the left-hand side, where uh, they show a customer who wanted to do the repainting of the home and wanted a quick loan or of a small amount. Uh, they actually can go to this uh, app, download the app, and actually put in some parameters, uh, and they can get a loan very quickly. Uh, so this guy got the personal loan uh, for this particular small need uh, without going through the hassle of going to a traditional bank and taking a longer time to invest and or to uh, pick up a loan from them or put a collateral of course there was some there should have been some kind of a collateral but in case of p2p lending in india for a smaller loan amount typically the collateral is not very big on the right hand side you see that uh, the fintech startups are actually selling gold um, in fact, they sold uh, more than 1,000 kilograms of gold in 10 months, uh, including phone pay, pay ATM, and so on. So traditionally, you used to buy the gold uh, from your typical uh, goldsmith uh, in your neighborhood. Um, but uh, even uh, gold is not a typical financial instrument, but gold is, uh, I, I would say it's not a typical uh, cash instrument, but it's, it's a typical investment instrument uh, for most of the Indian. Uh, our savings, or a lot of our savings actually go into gold even today, even though we are moving gradually to uh, investing more into uh, stock market or, or capital market through mutual funds and other routes. But what happened here is uh, the companies like Paytm, they realized the potential of allowing the customer to buy or invest into gold uh, conveniently online or digitally. Look at this graph on the left hand side. Uh, this is by uh, Accenture. Uh, uh, so Accenture came out with a report, what is happening in banking industry. The figure one on the left-hand side says the branchless banking is gaining acceptance very fast. Um, if you see here, typically an 18 to 34-year-old 30 uh, guy uh, or, 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 or a person where the number of the survey respondents were 940, they are the one who will switch to branchless banking. Uh, then, of course, 35 to 55 and 55 plus will be less likely. Uh, so the younger generation will be more uh, tech savvy. Uh, they will be uh, more uh, mobile in nature. They move very fast uh, and they, they, do, they don't like going to a branch and doing their banking transactions. They want to do everything at home as, as far as possible or remotely or online and anywhere, anytime banking. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, the personal customers which would like bank with the non-banking institutions like Square, PayPal, T-Mobile, Costco, Apple, Google, Amazon, AT&T. These are the person of customers who will actually use these services from a tr traditional non-banking company, okay? Or Walmart, Canada Post, uh, and so on. And we, we can see in India, uh, with the launch of payment banking, uh, like Airtel or, or Paytm, and even recently India Post, they've launched payment banking uh, services, right? Where you can open a bank account uh, for a smaller amount, correct? Um, alternative lending, we already uh, spoke about peer-to-peer -peer lending. This is gaining uh, fast acceptance uh, all over the world. Uh, lending Club uh, is a company, uh, very, very successful. Uh, it was turning the banking system into a frictionless uh, and very highly transparent and online marketplace where they can act like a matchmaker or a marketplace between the investors and the borrower. In Asia, uh, the alternative lending deals are actually continuing to shift away from China. Uh, uh, that's why I wanted to bring this slide up, uh, this graph, which says that India saw a spate of alternative lending deals, including the small business lending firm like Lending Cart, uh, micro lending companies like Avail Finance. We have a lot of NBFCs. We have a lot of micro lending institutions now in India. Even the uh, advanced startup uh, for salaries, like if you want to get an advanced salary for, for whatever need you have in your personal need, you can actually use a service from a company called as Early Salary, uh, which works with your traditional bank and your company uh, to enable uh, you to take an advanced uh, salary loan. Uh, or asset back online lender like uh, Rupee. If you see the numbers there from $87 million to $7 million, the investments uh, which are being done by the venture capitalist um, in alternative lending services is actually gaining acceptance very quickly and, uh, and, and very rapidly. And, and more so ever in India and China. Uh, you know why? If you go to US or any other country, you will see the maturity of the ecosystem for banking is much higher. But if you come to Africa or India, China or Southeast Asia, 
the maturity of the banking and the penetration of banking is actually comparatively lower uh, especially africa where mobile money is really big hit uh, uh, it actually became a big hit in africa before it started coming into india and china where people started tran uh, transacting over a mobile phone lending card of course we covered this um, which uh, now has uh, covered 950 plus cities across india they have dispersed more than uh, more than 20000 plus loans um, and impacted or helped more than 12500 plus businesses across india now let's look at uh, payments very quickly payments i think we all are very familiar with but this slide is just telling you that if you look at the ecosystem of payment uh, and payment processing there are typically five major players the acquirers and the processors which are typically the companies like Citibank, Chase, Manhattan, et cetera. The issuer of, 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 of a payment service, typically the company which will issue a, a debit or a credit card and for you to allow you to transact like MX, PNC, Chase, Citibank, Bank of America. The card network company, we all are familiar with Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover, uh, which act more like an aggregator, which allows you to uh, buy things on credit. Uh, then of course, there are two very important players, the gateways and the ISOs. The gateways are the companies which allow the transaction to happen through the channel. So they act like more like a pipe uh, between point A to point B. Let's say when you go and actually make a payment over Paytm, behind the scene, Paytm might run a gateway either by themselves or they might actually use some other service like uh, Bill Pay or Bill Desk uh, and so on, uh, which will actually help the transaction to happen and transaction to settle. Uh, so of course, there will be the companies which will help to settle the transaction at the end of the day which has the ISOs and the MSPs. Moving ahead, uh, in India, uh, MobiQuick, um, so this guy on the right-hand side is uh, the founder of MobiQuick, uh, Bipin Preet Singh. Um, they published uh, stats that uh, even with the acceptance of uh, mobile banking or digital banking in India, there are still 40 million merchants which are yet to go online. That's a huge opportunity for a market, right? 40 million is a huge number. And that's why you would have seen that the amount of investment coming into financial industry in India, typically companies like Paytm or, or PhonePay or MobiQuick is actually very, very large, right? Recently, uh, even Warren Buffet uh, came and invested into Paytm and uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma uh, actually became really excited about it. He posted a video. Um, the reason is that I think if you look at the potential of India or countries like India, the amount of people who are still yet to go online or transact online is still huge okay uh this is the screenshot of some of the payment companies in india uh now let's look at blockchain so we have covered the traditional banking services and payment services or transaction management services what is blockchain um i'm sure you would have heard of this term if you are uh, even uh, one person inclined with technology and and especially banking uh, technologies uh, see, blockchain is basically, uh, in a layman term, it's a database. It's a database that is distributed in nature, which means uh, it doesn't put the trust on us one single authority. So if you look at traditional banking, there will be one single company like ICICI, which acts like a traditional central authority to accept the payment and become your trusted partner. Then you go and transact with ICICI. Uh, which uh, transacts behind the scene maybe with RBI and some other settlement agencies and uh, helps the transaction to occur. But then your trust is all in one single entity here, right? Or maybe few sing few entities. But what blockchain is saying that why not distribute the trust and decentralize it across the entire ecosystem? Let's trust the crowd rather than trusting an individual. Let's trust all rather than trusting only few. Uh, that's what blockchain basically is in a very simple layman term. See, uh, if you look at the definition, it provides a decentralized database or a digital ledger of transaction that everyone on the network can see, number one. Uh, this network is essentially a chain of computers which are generating and storing the transactions. Now, don't get scared by the term that everyone can see the transaction. It is not that everyone is going to uh, see what exactly is happening in the system. That means if Vinay is transferring money to Kelvin, uh, people don't know Vinay, people don't know Kelvin. They both are a number and a number unique number or a hash code in the system even the transaction has a hash code uh, it's 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 like a complex crypto code uh, that is generated by an algorithm and it's very hard to re, uh, break or re, uh, re reverse engineer okay so people can anonymously see that the transactions are happening 
they cannot personally identify or cannot see the PII data, personally identifiable data. But the, uh, but the good part is that if the transactions happen, everyone in the system, uh, every node in the system or every computer that is actually part of the blockchain process can see it. That's typically true for a public blockchain. We'll talk about the other two flavors like private and hybrid blockchain. So typically, as I said, it is shared publicly. The servers or nodes are maintained. They maintain the entries of the data. So what happens is when you make a transaction in blockchain, uh, it is added into a page. Okay, let's page is like a let's take a paper A4 paper and you write a transaction number one. A hash code is generated is stored on the page. Then you do transaction two, then you do three, four, five and so on. A page let's say can store 100 transactions. Once it is stored 100 transactions, a new page is created, which is stored the 101st transaction. But what happens is the new page is linked with the previous page through a hash code and some algorithm and both the page are then become part of a block a block let's say can have maybe 100 pages and each page can have 100 transactions and then all these pages are linked together so the blocks of pages are linked together and they make a chain together that's why it's called a blockchain it is distributed there is no central authority required to approve the transaction it is very very highly secured the reason is because the algorithm that is designed uh, by the blockchain, whether it is uh, Ethereum or it is uh, Bitcoin or it is any other uh, blockchain technology like Hyperledger, uh, they are designed in a very secured way. It is trusted. So it's distributed nature of the network requires the computer to reach a consensus. See, the best part here is that at least 51% of the total participants needs to arrive at a consensus to allow a transaction to happen which typically means that the transaction will take longer than in a typical um, uh, a typical single point to point transaction to happen. But the technology is evolving very fast and very soon it might be even faster than the point to point. Uh, however, today it is slower than point to point transaction because it has to be recorded in every server in the system. And finally, it is automated. So the software is written so that conflictions or double transaction will never happen. It's basically atomic in nature. I think um, many a time when I go around in India and outside and I talk about blockchain or when we discuss people just correlate Bitcoin as blockchain. Many people have this uh, view that Bitcoin is equal to blockchain, but that's not true. Bitcoin is only one of the applications of blockchain, which is a cryptocurrency. It's a digital asset used as a medium of exchange, like in a traditional banking. It is very secured and secures the transactions and controls the supply of the currency okay in the system so that the value of the currency is maintained see we all know that like the supply of indian rupee is controlled uh, you cannot just keep printing indian rupee as much as you want unlike the us dollar uh, it's a subset of alternative currencies so uh, rather than the paper currency it is a digital currency however bitcoin was the first one uh, in 2009 to became the first decentralized cryptocurrency and it actually created the hype around blockchain as a technology but blockchain is also not uh, not just used in cryptocurrency. It is used also in uh, in supply chain logistics and other technologies. Uh, but from a uh, use case for banking guys like you, uh, typically uh, the applications is in the cryptocurrency, which is more relevant. Uh, these are some of the hundred cryptocurrencies, uh, the top hundred cryptocurrencies by market cap. Uh, this data is six months old, but still uh, quite uh, quite relevant. Uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and so on. If you see the market cap, it is enormous, right? The market cap column, it is it is huge. Uh, the price of Bitcoin uh, back then was around eight thousand dollar for one Bitcoin. Um, the volume, which is the total traded volume in, in a period of twenty four hours, right? It is five billion dollar, and the circulating uh, supply of the total Bitcoins out there. So uh, when we talk about blockchain, as I told you, it's a distributed database which is also a digital uh, ledger, um, DLT, uh, which is a term that you will frequently hear with blockchain. It is distributed ledger technology, more commonly called as blockchain uh, in, 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 a common, in a common language, which has captured the imagination of the financial industry. This slide tells you whether you talk about um, any uh, financial services. On the light hand side, if you see the bank, right? 80% of the banks in the world are experimenting with DLT, which is blockchain or distributed ledger. 24 plus countries are investing in DLT. 2,500 plus patents are filed in, uh, in DLT area. 90 plus central banks have engaged uh, in DLT discussions worldwide. That means it is not just a fad anymore. It is not just a hype. It is not just a buzzword. 
it is actually becoming becoming a real reality for everyone very soon the application of blockchain as i told you is not just in banking uh, if you see here on the left hand side the distributed decentralized transaction management but it is also in healthcare right see we, we discuss about blockchain and we say blockchain means distributed way of uh, implementing the trust and keeping the transaction or the data highly 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 secured so which are the other data that you want to be secured and real uh, real time available it is your healthcare data right the patient's record you want it to be very secured right because it's a very sensitive data uh, and you want it to be readily available you want it to be real time you want it to be uh, uh, having a backup everywhere uh, so that if i if one server goes down i can actually create a copy very quickly think about smart contracts in case of supply chain when uh, when a good is transferred from india to us there might be 50 parties involved from the from the producer to the consumer to the shipping industry to the trucking industry to the customs guy to the settlement guy to the insurance company the finance company which is underwriting it and so on so it's a huge supply chain of goods right and there are multiple stakeholders and they can use blockchain to have a smart contract definition between them and likewise of course in security voting and so on uh this slide is just telling you that blockchain ecosystem is really really huge it is becoming actually deeper and deeper uh and and uh, huge at the same time also fragmented which means the technology is being adopted by many players but over a period of time it will defragment there will be consolidation there will be mergers and so on but you see on the screen from currencies to developer tools to fintech companies in blockchain to exchanging value over blockchain to sharing the data especially internet of things at the top you see supply chain and logistics um uh, to authenticity means uh, creating an authentic id mechanism under blockchain everyone is actually looking at blockchain as a very important tool or as a technology But by the way the inventor of the blockchain is still not known today we all uh, think uh, that it's it's some japanese guy it got invented in somewhere in tokyo or japan but nobody knows actually who really is the the real inventor of this concept of blockchain uh, um, but yeah the we all know that it is super powerful as a technology and highly disruptive now quickly look look at the last thing for the day today before we go into the markets um, it's a uh, robotic process automation uh, if you ask me uh, actually it is a old wine in a new bottle see the automating processes is not new we have been doing it for a very long time right when you look at the repetitive task in a industry whether it is banking or insurance or financial services or any other and you try to automate it so that the machine can do it um, and do it well uh, reducing the errors which can be hap- uh, which can happen due to humans rpa is a use of software which actually leverages artificial intelligence machine learning capabilities to handle very high volume and repeatable task okay which were requ- uh, previously performed by humans for example very simple could be a task of actually um, Uh, validating uh, a financial record in an excel file um, and comparing them for example if i want to compare excel a with excel b which have the same columns for the sake of cross validation let's say it is uh, uh, the data of the transactions that happen in a day in a bank and i want to cross verify uh, with uh, let's say rbi's image of the same transactions uh, very simple example or it's a telecom company which wants to cross verify the total amount of talk time that got sold today and the amount of talk time that were used or maybe uh, recorded in my uh, in my uh, database so these are very repetitive tasks very uh, mundane in nature and and very well defined you have a well defined way of comparing two numbers they can be actually optimized through rpa but but there is one flavor coming up so what is happening in financial industry which is heavily regulated there is a high mandate for security uh, auditability reliability and also maintaining the data quality uh, and if you rely on human uh, it's possible that there are errors right uh, you need to probably recheck and recheck and check but when you actually start adopting technology and uh, and say that hey this is an automated repetitive task you pick this up and validate this file the chance of error are lower there will be errors but uh, far lower insurance claims uh, very very manual process right you go for an insurance claim even in uh, us today it's it's a highly manual process time consuming and also very very error prone and very uh, actually 
there are a lot of middlemen in between who actually come into play when you go for an insurance claim but i have seen companies uh, uh, which are adopting rpa uh, to automate the claims process uh, but they it's not just rpa but behind the scene there will be uh, other uh, technologies like ai ml uh, and, and and maybe robotics or maybe chatbots and other things which will come together to automate the process or make it easier smoother and faster uh, financial accounting. Uh, I don't know how many of you are CAs on the call. Uh, no, accounting is is a very large, uh, large vertical uh, in financial industry, right? Where a lot of data entry, uh, data monitoring, data massaging, uh, and manipulations, or even I, I won't call it manipulation, but data correction and gathering happens from multiple sources. Because I have to report my financial numbers, especially if I'm a public company, right? Uh, uh, here. Uh, the combination of RPA with machine learning, uh, as per the predictions by um, uh, one of the report in CB Insights, is that you can actually result into 10 times return on investment if actually you can combine this well for doing accounting process, or maybe even catching uh, the errors in accounting, or the red flags, or maybe the frauds and so on. Uh, likewise, of course, other applications of robotic process automations are in policy administration, invoicing business, uh, business travel audits uh, right whether i want to check the record of my employee travels and uh, and auditing whether they are really saying the truth whether they did, did travel from point a to point b they use this car they use this service they uh, they spend so much on food and so on uh, i can actually do it very well with uh, advanced technologies uh, we spoke about lending right loan origination so that industry is already adopting uh, uh, rpa very well or even credit check or credit scoring and KYCs. Uh, this is the Gartner hype cycle, uh, which is around for uh, for uh, technologies like uh, RPA. If you look at the hype cycle, the x-axis is the phase of the ecosystem of how mature it is. Is it at the creation stage very early? Is it surviving? Is it growing very rapidly? It has cross survival. Is it uh, maintaining the equilibrium or is it not declining as a technology? If you look at this chart, and the left hand side of y axis says uh, the business value it can add or generate from negative to high. The blockchain is right at the center with the pause sign, which basically means that this ecosystem of uh, uh, not blockchain, sorry, RPA is right at the center, robotic process automation. It says that RPA will mature between five to 10 years from today. Uh, and typically, Gartner is fairly um, not accurate but it's fairly correct when it predicts technology matur uh, maturity. It keeps evolving that over a period of time, but I think I agree that RPA will be very highly mature in uh, between four to five years from today. Uh, last uh, for the uh, set of uh, discussion today will be around very quickly on the markets. Um, these are some of the unicorns or the companies whose valuation is more than $1 billion in FinTech. Uh, there are already 26 uh, FinTech uh, which were valued at uh, of 77.6 billion dollar across the world including india when you look at india it shows paytm there when you look at china and europe there are a few companies and of course north america is the largest ecosystem uh, us banks slowed down fintech investing so over the last five quarters top top us bank including goldman city group uh, jp morgan uh, the investment in fintech is slowing down uh, which does not necessarily really mean that the industry is slowing down which which could also mean that the industry is maturing maybe the amount of investment going into fintech is reducing but the maturity of the ecosystem is increasing okay that means maybe the companies are able to survive on their own and they don't need external money which could also very uh, very possible uh, this is again uh, showing the picture uh, where the top 10 banks are investing in fintech uh, in US. Uh, I don't know the numbers for India, uh, but uh, we spoke about that slide where the banking companies are partnering with or collaborating with the fintech companies. And we saw that it's a huge ecosystem. Um, and I think we are done for the day uh, in terms of what we wanted to cover. Uh, so we can now open up uh, for question and answer. Kelvin, if you want to take it over. Uh, yes, Vinay, thank you so much. Uh, it was a really interesting session. 
Uh, guys, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comment section and uh, we'll go ahead and answer your questions. Vinay, we've got a few questions uh, coming in from our attendees and uh, yeah, if you could go ahead and answer these questions, it would be appreciated. Actually, I'm not able to see the question screen very uh, clearly. Uh, I don't know why. I'm not able to drag it down and see the questions. Um, okay, I'll read out the questions to you. Um, yeah, if you don't mind. We've got Sachin Gombal out here. Um, his his question is, is this course specifically for, um, one second. Okay, is this course specifically for people with banking or finance background? Um, do you want to take it up, Kelvin, or someone from uh, Matikas? Uh, yeah, uh, I'd be happy to go ahead and take that question. Uh, Sachin, uh, this question, this, uh, this, course is uh, not specifically for people uh, in the banking and finance background. Uh, although experience in banking is definitely uh, going to be taken into consideration, uh, it's not really restricted to anybody from the banking background. So I'd uh, recommend that you get in touch with uh, Imarticus's uh, career counselors and they'd be the best ones to assist you. Vinay, the next question we have is, can you please give an example of AI usage in banking? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, before that, I will just like to answer Sachin also. Uh, Sachin, uh, I think that uh, when you look at the course structure, right, this is uh, going to touch on blockchain, AI, machine learning, um, uh, RPA, and so on. And I think I uh, covered some examples that blockchain uh, is not only applicable in uh, banking, but many other industries. Likewise, RPA, likewise, AI, machine learning. Uh, so even if you don't have a finance background, I think this course can be very helpful in terms of giving you an all-round exposure of different uh, latest disruptive technologies. Uh, and I think we all should become familiar with it. Um, but now coming back to Binaya's questions about example of AI usage in banking. So uh, I, I think I touched upon one, one of the example, right? Uh, if you look at uh, uh, machine learning, right? What machine learning is all about? It's basically saying that I learned the... Uh, I learn from the data that is fed to me and I start making more, uh, deriving more insights from the data. Now, uh, let's say you and I are part of ICICI Bank. Uh, and before AI was there, uh, they were able to look at me as a customer and look at multiple data points about Vinay or Vinaya and then make some inferences as a human being, right? Now, uh, if I want to now lend uh, or Vinaya comes to the bank and looks for a loan, uh, now what can happen is that because I can capture so many data points about Vinaya uh, from multiple sources and more importantly, I can build a model that can uh, take this data uh, and using some parameters and some algorithm, it will say that if Vinaya actually posts only responsible things on Facebook, then he's a responsible person. Okay. If you always post uh, things like, hey, I'm spending my money on going to casino. Hey, I'm spending my money and I'm regularly on travel. Um, okay, then I know a habit about Vinaya, right? That as a person, he's he's actually fond of spending money on X, Y, Z. Um, when I make my decision, I can actually train my algorithm and say uh, that if this person is actually a person who has a habit of saving money or a, a person who has probably uh, done something responsibly, which I can derive from various uh, inputs online, I can give him a good credit score. Or, or a higher score. If I see this person as a very irresponsible person, uh, I will probably flag him as a more riskier person. Now, it doesn't mean that by just posting something online, you will be flagged as an irresponsible person in this example. Uh, it means that there will be multiple inputs which are taken about you to derive a, a, a value. Uh, and that value is, is typically a mathematical number, uh, which is based on a mathematical model. Uh, so everything you write in a machine learning is typically a model that runs on some numbers which are fed to it. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, Kelvin, we can move to the next question. Yes, uh, Vinay, the next question okay. we have here is from Sagnik. The question is, is being fluent in machine learning and be a prerequisite for FinTech? Uh, not necessarily. I think if you, uh, you by BA, you mentioned business analytics? Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> see, uh, fluency in machine learning is not necessary for everyone. Um, when you do machine learning, you need different kind of people. You need someone who can code. You need someone who understands the domain very well. 
you need someone who understands the process very well you need uh, someone who probably understands the domain and the data that is going to be captured and fed into the model very well so you don't need only someone who can actually code in machine learning but you also need other experts around it to actually derive value from the machine learning so you don't have to be fluent in one thing uh, as far as you actually bring something which is of value uh, to the uh, to the ecosystem so typically in a blockchain also for example you won't need only someone who can write an algorithm and create a hash code you might need other people uh, people who can harness the uh, the cycles of cpus people who actually can make sense of the transaction people who can actually verify and validate the transactions and so on business analytics of course is a is a very important uh, skill set to have which is like a common soft skill i would say it's not a hard skill so someone who can understand the business analyze the data or analyze the business or a situation at at hand is required at every point in career whether it is um, a technical or non technical right so it's, it's it's more of a soft skill that of course is is useful but for fintech i think understanding uh, one of the technologies uh, is is good uh, understanding the impact of this technologies for example i i i actively work in internet of things and uh, i'm not a coder anymore i left left coding like 6 years back uh, but but it's important for me to understand the domain to understand the customers requirement or pain points and make sure that i know whether i can apply iot there or not likewise for fintech right the, where, where you understand what is potentially possible using fintech and and what is the problem at hand that i can solve using fintech <coughs> excuse me all right and i thank you so much the next question we have is please tell us with an example what type of transactions are conducted in blockchain that's by amit okay uh blockchain amit uh, blockchain has all type of transaction in it right that you do in a traditional uh, banking uh if you look at blockchain today like let's pick up an example of bitcoin the the most basic transaction is uh, selling or buying or transferring money right from point a to point b so i can transfer uh, money uh, to to you and that is a transaction so there will be credit there will be a de debit right which is a traditional banking transaction that happens in blockchain if you pick up uh, supply chain logistics right as an example of blockchain application uh, the the data that will be stored or the record that will be stored there will be the record of the transfer of goods so it will store that uh, the good a or apples left kashmir and they were transported in a truck uh, uh, from from kashmir to delhi for example that's a transaction uh, then uh, the apple box were picked up from uh, from delhi and put into a plane that's a transaction and then they reached and landed singapore that's a transaction and then they got uh, picked up by a distributor or wholesaler that's a transaction if you go to healthcare uh, example um, and you go to a practitioner and uh, get your blood pressure checked that blood pressure will be recorded as a data point for vinay uh, and that will be a record in blockchain okay so uh, it could be all this type of transaction or data or record that have to be stored into a database yeah kelvin you can thank you vinay uh, we have time for one more question uh, we take this question by ankit he asks how ai usage affects the finance career and in what areas can we focus in finance very good question so um, see finance uh, no no in finance there are multiple career options right uh, you can be a sales and a marketing guy in finance industry where you are actually dealing with the customer or or actually uh, promoting your products uh, you you can be in uh, multiple areas like uh, client relationship management uh, or uh, uh, wealth management or you can be a research analyst sitting at a desk and analyzing the data uh, or you can be of course in a retail banking like uh, be a teller or someone who actually uh uh do, do the administrative or hr or other functions so there are multiple uh, applications in in finance now when you look at ai or um how it will uh, impact uh someone who is in financial services or financial technologies uh, is 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 actually very widespread in nature because as i told you see basically what is ai is nothing but it says that the moment i have more information about 
something which could be a transaction which could be a person which could be a process which could be a company and i have a suitable way of analyzing the data i can help you to derive more insights from the data right which means um, if you are a research analyst right and you are looking at a data of size one terabyte in front of you definitely you will probably use an excel uh, to uh, pivot the data manipulate the data and you will try to create some insights from it but now if you have a model running behind the scene where you can fed this data to the model which is properly trained uh, okay by a test data which says that if i feed this uh, 10 data points and tell you the weights of each data point and this is how you need to compute the score or let's say the credit score and give me an output this ai can help you very fast right it it will actually run in matter of seconds or maybe few minutes if it is really huge data um, and give you an output or give you a result or an insight so yeah, for a, for a, for someone who is getting into fintech understanding ai is important and then on top of ai it's like a, it's like a bottom layer then you can apply it in multiple uh, career points right you can become a research analyst you can become a um, you can become a financial analyst you can become a financial technology expert a financial domain expert you can actually even play a role of a coder right you can if you understand technology or engineering very well you can go and write a model yourself in uh, in in languages like r and so on so what i'm trying to say here is when you look at all these things that we touched today rpa blockchain ai machine learning uh, iot uh, and so on uh, they all are enablers right and if you understand them well uh, the career options that you want to pick up after that uh, can be based on what you really bring to the table what is your experience what is your background what current industry you are working on and what current our uh, target job you are looking at or target career you are looking at the only advantage or, or the most important advantage would be that you will be equipped to make your decision well and be ready to compete in the market because if you don't know what is going to disrupt your industry then you are at much bigger risk uh, compared to knowing it all or at least some of it thank you so much vinay for answering all of these uh, questions unfortunately as i said we don't have the time to address each and every question that you guys have but uh, do definitely feel free to get in touch with the marcus learning and one of our senior career experts will definitely answer all of the questions you have uh, personally within the session was extremely interesting and uh, yeah as we see 63% of our attendees were uh, found the found the webinar very interesting so thank you so much uh, it was uh, if if you guys would also like to refer to this webinar in the future it will be available to you on our youtube channel in seven working days please do like share and subscribe to the channel for more practical and insightful information you can also follow us on facebook twitter and instagram Thank you so much everyone thank you Vinay and have a good evening